Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to take about 40 odd minutes to talk about climate change archaeology, a concept I developed about 10, 15 years ago. Um, part out of a desire to make archaeology relevant to the to the modern world, and I confess um, discussions in those days whether archaeology should have a role in the modern world were sometimes a bit tedious, but also because I genuinely uh, have been involved in, in work that relates to climate change for nearly all my professional life. And as a coastal wetland specialist, you know, you can't ignore the impact uh, of sea level rise that, that impacts your daily life, uh, finding sites in the foreshore and, and see how erosion works and how sea level rise works. And, and therefore, I was very interested in how can I make that research, that academic research I was doing, relevant for a world um, that is going to have to um, really adapt to climate change that is quite serious. And the picture you see in the background is actually not by me. It is by a professor in meteorology here at the University of Reading at Hawkins. And we called it the climate stripes. And what you can see from left to right is uh, the average global temperatures between 1850 and 19. 2020 and uh, with 1900 being the neutral white color and if it's blue it's it's cooler than what happens in uh, 1900 and if it's red it's it's warmer than than that uh, period of time and and we use it to try and visualize the real impact that climate change have and so although i'm no longer really i can really call myself a practicing archaeologist anymore but as a vice chancellor at the university of reading I've set out to make this the greenest university in the country to, in everything we do, research, in teaching, in how we operate our estate, how much we fly around the world, to become genuinely a green university. Uh, and and uh, the climate stripes are one way of expressing that desire to, uh, to be green in anything we do. But let's go back to archaeology. So four questions I ask myself uh, in this talk. Who is afraid of climate change? What is climate change archaeology? Uh, coastal wetlands, or so my own area, an example of how we can operationalize that concept of climate change archaeology. And then, uh, in case you're interested in becoming an activist and using as an archaeologist, um, a, you know your knowledge uh, in how we can make help change the world in the face of climate change. A couple of take-home messages for you. But let's start, maybe. 10, 15 years ago, when I, I I tried to start formalizing what it meant to be a climate change archaeologist. And I'll come, come to that in a moment, what I really mean to it. And it was a time where there were still plenty of people who didn't believe in global warming. And I know this is a, a Banksy attributed uh, piece of work. Uh, but, but, you know, it isn't that long ago that there were plenty of, well, uh, people, organizations, politicians, who were actively arguing that cl climate change wasn't real. Um, and, and because I've always had an interest in, in coasts and floods, and, and I still do a lot of work in that, um, you know, it, it always felt very strange that the observable reality is one where climate change has a real impact already, even 10, 15 years ago, um, and that people were still arguing against it. And I'm afraid archaeology, 15 years ago wasn't much better. Um, archaeologists were often, uh, or maybe maybe the, the the press offices in universities that picked up archaeological stories with this consistent refrain that climate change is nothing new. And on, on the one hand, uh, that could well have meant to say there is something we can learn from the past because people have had to adapt to climate change all along. But it was often presented uh, by the climate change skeptics as as evidence that um, the scientific world was divided whether climate change as we know it now as a, in a way forced by human activity anthropogenetically uh, forced climate change is not dissimilar to natural climate change that we've seen in the past. And I confess, when I started talking to climate change scientists 15 years ago, explaining that I was an archaeologist, I wasn't necessarily welcomed. Now, I know, at least from the, the Birmingham archaeologists, I know them personally quite well. They never meant to say that there was no such a thing as uh, modern climate change. But you can see how sometimes stories 
uh, can get mixed and we didn't do ourselves many favors in this area. Now things have changed and I'll, I'll just take a few minutes to try and explain this graph. So this is a very simple exercise using Google Scholar to try and understand how much attention archaeologists pay to climate change. So in blue, series one, you see the columns they either refer to the numbers on the left hand side of the table of how many times if you put in Google climate change and archaeology as an as an as a, as a request, how many times you hit that. And you can see that that's so in latter years you have like 20,000 hits a year on that. And I then uh, also do the same is to get a background, is just do the same for archaeology. Uh, and you can see that sometimes 150, 160 articles or, or hits you get in Google Scholar if you just ask archaeology year by year by year. Uh, and I just and you can see that there are some methodological issues in the background. But if you think of it, that the orange bars uh, account for over three million hits, um, you can probably get a sense of, of yes, there may be methodological issues around Google Scholar and how it records this and what it exactly records. But as an as a meta analysis, it probably works quite well. And then the white line, and that refers then to the percentages on the right hand side of your graph. Uh, the white line is really about dividing uh, the the number of uh, articles or hits that, that look at climate change and archaeology by those with just archaeology and see whether you can see a trend. And there is quite a clear trend. And the trend is something like this. So that up to 2008, about 8% of articles or hits in archaeology refer to climate change. And normally that had to do that uh, archaeologists observed that there were changes, change in the culture, change in agriculture, change in occupation or population that somehow was uh, correlated to observe changes in climate. Uh, and that was a quite a common theme, but it only accounted for about 8% of all the articles up to about 2008. And since 2008, you can see that the number of archaeologists mentioning climate change has gone steadily up to about now around 30 to 35%. Um, and I, and like I said, I take all the criticism on the data, but I think that trend is absolutely real. So what happens in 2007, 2008 to make that change? Well, uh, it was the publication of the, uh, the fourth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC. The, that was the report that was awarded uh, the Nobel Prize uh, and also the year uh, of the Inconvenient Truth being uh, uh, published, uh, a film that uh, had huge impact on many people that we are looking genuinely at an, a human or a fossil fuel force burning, fossil fuel burning force climate change that is changing the world. And if you now start to dig into what kind of articles you get, there is still a lot of archaeologists who start to correlate climate changes in the past with changes in behaviors observed in the archaeological record. That has genuinely gone up. Uh, a lot of that increase in archaeologists looking at climate change is also to do with heritage management. And I know uh, in this series there are several uh, other speakers who talk about this. So the, our sites, my wetland sites, drying out, uh, upland sites having to deal with intensive rainfall, sites being flooded, sites, um, uh, buildings that are still being used, having to adapt to uh, uh, to warmer temperatures and uh, increased rainfall uh, or increased intensity of rainfall in the winter. But what is interesting also that in that increase of um, uh, in increased mentioning of climate change by archaeologists, we started to find a clear trend of people who are now looking to make sense of the archaeological records to help inform uh, future adaptation to climate change. And I think it has created an, an, an head of steam now where, uh, so whilst the sixth assessment report of the IPCC is to come out in the next few weeks, but for the first time IPCC has now approached uh, archaeologists, particularly in America, to see whether they can start developing an, an, uh, a narrative of how archaeology and anthropology can be used in mitigating and adapting to climate change for the seventh assessment report that will be published in five or six years' time. So I think part of the work I was trying to do is, is, is indeed starting to, 
to gather some uh, ahead of steam and is moving in that direction that I was hoping for. But let me go back to my own work and a bit giving you an example of the thing, how it can be done, what the challenges are, and what climate change archaeology is about. Now, I'll take a step back in my own reading and uh, anybody who wants to play a role in climate change studies and wants to, you know, say have something to say about it cannot do that without consulting the IPCC's reports. Uh, they are, yes, they are compromised reports, but they are authoritative reports that summarize a huge amount of research, which, you know, if you if you want to understand where the, where the world and the thinking is, this is the place to go to. And I say, don't buy any of the old copies. The, the, the sixth assessment report will come out shortly. But the IPCC has organized itself in three working groups. Uh, two of them are really important to us. One is the physical science basis. So how do we know that climate is changing? Uh, and what does it mean in terms of the physical science? And that is the work of working group one. And how humanity uh, experiences climate change, how it adapts and what our vulnerabilities are, is the subject of working group two. So your working group three is about mitigating. So can you extract carbon? out of the atmosphere in a clever way, which is not really, I think, a role for us archaeologists. But what was very interesting for me reading the, the fourth climate of our assessment report was that when you talk about the physical science base, this is all about understanding the past in order to understand and predict the future. So there, there is a very extensive article about uh, climate change in the past, which is then forms that then forms the basis for many of the models on which future forecasts are made. So the past and an understanding, a deep understanding of the past in understanding the physical basis of climate change is really important. However, if you then move into what it means for humanity in terms of impact, adaptation and vulnerability, the past completely disappears. And up till the fifth assessment report, there was virtually no reference to uh, archaeology, history, or anthropological studies of how uh, long-standing societies with traditional methods and uh, of agriculture, traditional methods of irrigation, were referenced. So, and I saw there that gap. So, there is a very good understanding of past climate change, but what it meant to people in the past was never a source of inspiration or learning for what it means for us in the future. And that is, I think, where I then decided climate change archaeology should focus on the strength of the work of, the, of the, the physical science but the information that we have how people adapt to climate change in the past can really help us in the future so uh when you've sorry I'm, i hope i didn't uh click on something there sorry so climate change archaeology sees the archaeological record as a resource of information, how people in the past adapted to climate change, which you could say is very similar to what environmental archaeology is already trying to do. But what climate change archaeology is trying to do is make a following step, and that is to make and help us understand uh, better what archaeology can do for modern climate change debates. So it is no longer good to find those correlations if you cannot draw out some kind of information that we can use today or in the future. I would make two quick comments, uh, making sure that I'm not going to be either re uh, recalled a, a environmental determinist or an environmental relativist. So the two provisors that I would always uh, have in mind that is that this does not imply that everything in the archaeological record is a consequence of climate or environmental change. Lots of things change because of agency or environmental ingenuity uh, or other reasons. Uh, but I would also say it does mean that people in the past had no option but to change the way they lived their lives as their climate changed. It's very hard to believe that any society, including our own here today, can pretend that climate change is happening and just continue to work what it is. So I'm trying to find a hybrid position between that, well, the, the 15 years ago debates between well, uh, environmental determinism and environmental relativism. Uh, neither is correct but you can't ignore uh, the impact of climate change on past societies. So 
how do you operationalize how do you operationalize that now i'm an, as i said uh, i've always worked all my life in in coastal wetlands uh sea level changes always happen so it seemed very straightforward to think about sea level rise in the past as a proxy of understanding what happens uh, when sea level rise faster and faster under a climate change scenario. And I looked at three areas. Uh, I compared three low-lying areas across the world uh, and see what happens today in terms of management of uh, on sea level rise, how what happens in the past in managing sea level rise, and what we as archaeologists can deduct from that, both in you know, what does it mean from the past, but how can we extract some information from that that makes sense uh, for for us in the, in the 21st century. And the three areas I, I chose was the North Sea, which I knew very well from, from working there a lot. Um, the Sundarbans, so that is on the India-Bangladesh border. That is the delta where the Euphrates and the Brahmaputra come out, a very, very extensive low-lying land. Uh, and Florida, which um, of course, as, as uh, you will know, is, is pretty flat. It's flatter than the Netherlands. Uh, or I should say we have a hill that is higher than the highest hill in Florida, but where um, the impacts of sea level rise have been felt uh, for thousands of years as well. So I looked at three areas and then do some comparison. And I'll and apologies if I skip over any detail on the archaeology, but that's not the point I wanted to make. The point is about how do we, as an archaeologist, approach adaptation to climate change in the past that can help us in the future. So quick introduction to those three areas. Um, all three areas, and they, 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 the pictures are on different scale, but all three areas will see significant flooding uh, under a one meter uh, sea level rise scenario if it wasn't for human intervention. And so, for example, if you look at the North Sea, you can see how much of the Netherlands would flood if it wasn't for human intervention. But you can also see extensive parts of England uh, and Wales to a point that will flood under the one meter scenario, one meter around a sea level rise scenario. In the Sundarbans, it would be devastating. Half the Sundarbans will be submerged under uh, the sea uh, if no other action is taken and not much action is being taken. And I'll show you in a moment what that means for the Sundarbans already on an annual basis. And in Florida, there are large parts, uh, particularly in the south, you know, now the Everglades, uh, you will all know of, uh, but also around Tampa and Jacksonville, and and there are large areas in in Florida that will be flooded, and and uh, because of the geology, the limestone geology of much of Florida, um, or they have already found that groundwater uh, has become uh, salty or brine, uh, and that many of the agricultural practices that uh, have been practiced in Florida for many uh, decades. Uh, can no longer take place there because the, the water quality has been affected quite a bit. And and to be honest, you know, none of those areas are necessarily free from the risks of actually being being flooded. Now around the North Sea, we thankfully haven't had a major flood for the last 60, 70 years. And the picture, the black and white picture on your left here, is of the 1953 floods that killed nearly 300 people in the UK, but was responsible for nearly 2,000 deaths uh, in Holland alone. Um, in the Sundarbans, the picture on the, on the, on the bottom here in color, uh, floods happen every year. Um, people have adapted in the sense that uh, their houses are built on, on, on rises in the, uh, within their house stead. But nevertheless, uh, it is not uncommon to have several hundreds of deaths uh, in the Sundarbans on an annual basis. Um, as um, the, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, uh, the ice melts in the Himalayas, there's a lot of water coming down the systems. Uh, and that if that coincides with um, high tides. Um, and in Florida, the picture on the top, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, it is a great picture, you know, new, new build. Uh, Holiday resorts, uh, sometimes within years of being built, are being flooded because, uh, well, I, uh, simply because the thought process of how do you make sustainable development is not really taking place there. So all all of the three areas experiencing floods, even though around the North Sea, 
it is a little bit old. Uh, we are you now 50, 60 years ago that the last major floods were taking place. And, and in all three areas, uh, people are actively trying to work uh, to prevent floods taking place. So the picture here on your right, clearly it's the Netherlands, we're building a dike for an embankment. But even in the Netherlands, so this may be a very um, idiosyncratic picture, but even in the Netherlands, the majority of the land is protected by natural dune systems that, of course, manage and protect it, but they are natural systems. But where there are gaps in those dune systems, uh, the Dutch build dikes, and the dikes are getting higher and higher in some places now, eight meters above sea level, because um, yeah, there is no there is no solution once you cut the the land from the sea, and I'll come to that in a moment. In uh, in the uh, Sundarbans, there is now increasing programs to try and protect uh, and uh, uh, the the, man the mangrove swamps, the mangrove forests, which are very very good. At taking out the impact of uh, of, of, of waves and uh, rising sea levels, and in the United States, you know the same team of American uh, engineers that uh, in the 1950s were draining the Everglades have been brought in to wet the Everglades again, because there's a clear recognition that if you have a major storm or a hurricane, hurricane coming over, that these natural wetlands are actually very good at absorbing the power of that storm and the high tides and floods that come with it so we all we, we're not we're not all mad but we are trying to you know undo some time of the lessons or we're learning the lessons from the recent past the 20th century uh, and the 21st century has seen some nice um, you know ways of working with nature um, uh, if, even though sometimes human intervention really is required now that's what we're doing now what happened in the past in the past, there was a very different way of thinking about living with sea level change. So these are two pictures from around the North Sea, uh, from the Netherlands and from Germany. And we call these circular mounds, uh, Terps in the Netherlands and Weerden in Germany. And this is a, uh, a way of living in a dynamic coastal environment with sea level rise between 500 BC and 500 AD. Uh, 8500. So about a thousand years, people were living on these uh, artificially uh, made islands uh, with a bit of edible agriculture on the mounds and uh, livestock grazing on the salt marsh. Salt marsh grazing is very good for most animals. Uh, and these were sustainable, high productive and quite wealthy societies. So the Roman Empire never extended this far north. But uh, when on all the excavations taking place on these turps and Weerde, you find lots of Roman imports, and there was a clear interaction and, and trade with the, uh, with the Roman Empire going on. Uh, and the fact that people could live like this for a thousand years is actually quite interesting. And you know, when I talk to my well, to, talk to my Dutch family, they all believe that the Dutch dikes will survive a thousand years, and there is absolutely no way that will happen, but people in the past did have ways of thinking about living sustainably with sea level change that we seem to have forgotten about. And the, the Dutch and German or the, the tribes that, that used to live uh, 2000 years there were not the only ones. In the Sundarbans, they had some similar ideas. So the picture here on the bottom with the tower, that's an 13th century Shiva temple and as you can see it, it rises above the rice paddies uh, and that was deliberately so the, the, the podium on which this temple is built is quite extensive and the, 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 the temple is still active uh, you can talk to the people how and why you no know, it was built like it and this podium was used in times of high water where people could bring their most important possessions to uh, and, um, and their livestock uh, and, and they have a survived flood. So they, they were thinking about living with sea level rise without trying to stop the sea necessarily coming onto their land. And uh, the tower is near um, Diamond Harbour, so pretty close to the Indian Ocean. Uh, great site uh, uh, and, and really fascinating. And the first excavations were taking place when I was there to try and understand whether other structures were built to protect people during periods of storm. The picture on the top is in Bangladesh, in the Sundarbans, Kolitapera. Uh, it is a very interesting site. Uh, I've, I confess I have not been able to visit it myself. Um, but if you can see, this is a 
Google Earth picture and hopefully you can just see out the square outline of a mount and I'll just highlight it by this red square. So around this, there is that embankment that was built, we think around two, two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, and just give you a sense of scale, you know, it can be picked up by Google Earth. This is about a two and a half kilometer by two and a half kilometer square. And it sits in the center of an island. And there is this sense that how you deal with periods of floods is that you could drive again all your cattle into this enclosure. People from around the island could come here and have, uh, for the periods of high water, a protected area without stopping the sea. Um, necessarily flooding the land of the rest of the island. Um, you know, one, one day when, I, when I'm still being vice chancellor and can become an archaeologist again, it would be great to go out and, and get a better understanding of the, the dating and the phasing and the internal activity of this particular activity. And maybe one of the most interesting uh, elements in the Sundarbans is a strange mixture of Hinduism and Muslim beliefs that, that centers around the tiger, and I hope you can see in this picture the tiger just coming around. But there is this broad um, kind of uh, focal belief that is shared by Hindus and Muslims in this area um, that the mangrove swamps are protected by the tiger. And in times of need, genuine need, you're allowed to enter those woods and take what you need. The wood, uh, maybe the honey from the bees, maybe uh, the tubers for food. But if you are become if you become greedy and take too much, um, you know the tiger will be there to take revenge. And the, the tiger has an has an uh, a deity status in that belief. And this is a tiny little shrine that that you find in many many places around the Sundarbans. And you can see in the offerings that have been made that it is still an active belief. So this is this is drawing on the past and the faith of people to make them view their own protecting mangrove swamps and mangrove woodlands uh, as a sacred site that is there for you to use when you need to, but not when you don't. And uh, a long-standing religion that that uh, still plays a part in protecting the Sundarbans uh, from flooding. And then we have Florida. Um, in Florida, you find these mounds with uh, made of shellfish. Uh, so this is the shell of shellfish. Uh, they're enormous. Uh, lots of excavations taken place, uh, and it is shown that these were collected and and heaped in in these in these mounds in a deliberate fashion. And often they were refashioned. A sea level cha change took its toll, or socioeconomic changes required a different uh, formation of these heightened areas. Um, and you know, you can read the carbon date shell uh, easily. So you then find that large amounts of shell were, were pulled up and reformed to create the right kind of landscape. And as, and as far back as the 19th century, uh, archeologists like Cushing who worked in Florida recognized that this deliberate shaping and reshaping of these mounds was one way in which the Calusa Indians, as, as the kind of the, the generic name given to uh, pre-conquest uh, uh, First Nations there, uh, were managing uh, how to live with sea level change. And the picture on the right is Crystal Bay. And again, it looks like a, a normal island now, but it is wholly made up of uh, oyster shells. And you only need to you know, scrape around and you find lots of pottery there. And again, um, people created and shaped these islands to live in very rich environments, but they, they took an active role in managing their roles. And I think this is one little arrow I think that I can bring up. It shows that uh, you know, even in the 20th century, people could recognize the value uh, of these mounds and they were probably still being reshaped to create the nice platform for your modern house. So, so very quickly, people in the past knew a thing or two about sea level rise and had an, an idea of how you could live sustainably and sustainably I mean over a thousand years on the coast exploiting that rich resource that always comes with dynamic coasts without necessarily being flooded on a regular basis. Okay so as an archaeologist I would now draw my lessons from the past. I would compare and contrast how uh, societies were successful in coping with sea level rise and those that were not so successful. 
eventually. And, and you can see here kind of a summary that I would do as an archaeologist. So the successful ones, those who lasted a thousand years or more, adapted to rising sea levels by raising the settlements through turbs or mounds or shell minutes. And what they do is they, they allow the continued natural sedimentation deposition processes. In other words, if you allow the sea to come onto the land, it will raise the level of the land because there's always a deposition of sediments taking place. And therefore, it's automatically more sustainable. Um, there is no increased risk of catastrophic floods. There is very little evidence of that. You retain the biodiverse rich richness of the dynamic coast. And in other words, you can retain your agricultural practices. And it nearly always means using your salt marshes to the best effect. But fishing is often really, fishing and the shellfish resource stay really quite rich. And on the other hand, how not to do it? You could nearly think about collapse theory, but I, I hate that idea of collapse because people are cleverer than that. But you know, what you do see is that you, when you interrupt the natural sedimentation processes by building elongated dikes or embankments that stop the sea coming onto the land, that the land does not rise with sea level. So you know, if, and if you fly to Holland here and land in Schiphol, you will see very proudly uh, signs saying, you know, you're now minus five meters below sea level. But you know what? It's not sustainable in a thousand year time frame. Something will give. And if it's not the floods, it will be the changing to your uh, groundwater that make that will sever severely limit what you can do and what you can't do with it. So it, it is not something that will last for them. But of course, we've seen societies building elongated dikes uh, and embankments uh, from before the Romans, and they never seem to last very long. You know, that, that stopping the sea. Uh, playing King Canute is not the way to work. And and it often ends wrong when you then see uh, greatly, uh, it's a, a catastrophic flood takes place. Great for archaeologists sometimes because preservation is brilliant. But clearly that was never the intended uh, approach to dealing with climate change. But maybe more importantly is that if you take away the dynamic interaction between the land and the sea, you denude the biodiversity of the coast, both of the, the land side and the seaside. And whilst it may give you ex opportunities to expand edible agriculture in the short term or in the medium term, the, there are problems in the long term, like saltwater incursion in your groundwater. And what is also very well documented is how much the fish stock and the diversity of the fish stock is reduced when the normal nutrients that come off from a, a, a flooding or an incursion on land is no longer taking place. And we've seen that everywhere around the world that uh, elongated dike systems have a direct impact on the richness of the fish resource, which was often the first the reason why you were settling on the coast in the first place. Now, lessons from the past like this is probably nothing new to you. Uh, you know, this is not necessarily how it works. But the next part of climate change archaeology is all about how can I draw something out of this that we can uh, use in the modern era. And, and this is my attempt for my study uh, of those coastal areas. So I looked at four questions. Is long-term understanding of sea level coast interaction applied in coastal management today? Is an understanding of past successes and failures applied in coastal management? Is attention given to the sense of place in coastal management? And I think that's really quite important because, you know, if you if you build in, in a dike eight meters high, you might as well live a long, long way from the coast. But then also our logistical solutions from the past adopted in coastal management. And then if you look at uh, the three areas I look at, and uh, I, you know, I, I'll I'll I'll, I, I'll just summarize it, but. Around the North Sea, yes, that is an understanding of these long-term processes have really been applied in coastal management today. So around the North Sea, there are now, are now around 60 managed retreat projects where you deliberately break open the elongated embankments or dikes and allow the sea again to flood part of the land. Part of it is to, get, to create biodiversity gains, but part also to take the pressure off the sea as it starts to rise on the remaining dike system. So you do it in areas of uh, relative low value agricultural land. And interestingly enough, around the North Sea, they found that the, the best areas to apply this managed realignment to is to go to the last areas that were cut off from the sea. So people in the past started with the, the, the easy wins, the, the easy gains and, and 
and, and uh, protected from the sea, but the further and further you go, the greater the impact it has on the, uh, the hydrology and hydrodynamics of, of the sea. And therefore, you, if you take the, the most recent projects and give it back to the sea, you have the, the best impact for it. And as archaeologists have been involved with sometimes determining and helping um, managers to find those areas that were most recently unpolded or embanked uh, in order then to be able to have the optimum return uh, back into this into uh, coastal management. Uh, past successes and failures applied in coastal management, well, sometimes we're not very good at learning lessons from the past and I think there's something for us to do, but you know, the things have been tried and failed and sometimes and uh, we can help uh, learn lessons better than uh, if you leave it to coastal managers alone. Is attention given to the sense of place in coastal management? Or rather not see increasingly so, it's increasingly seen that just cutting off land from the sea is uh, not helping anybody. Sorry, I, I, I think it's time to mow the grass around my building again. So I hope you can uh, hear me without too much interruption. Uh, and and uh, it, it happens increasingly so and our logistical solutions from the past adopted in coastal management again and sometimes. So the Environment Agency, both in the Netherlands and in the UK, or in England, I should say, are starting to go back to windmills. And I mean windmills, not turbines, uh, in order to create uh, pumping systems uh, that can help achieve uh, zero net carbon uh, management of low-lying lands. And, and so simple windmill with an Archimedean screw can do the pumping for you. Uh, it doesn't, once you've installed it, it doesn't need any diesel to run. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's only a six of a 400 year old solution that was widely adopted around the North Sea. We decided that diesel pumps were better, and now we're going back to these ideas in the past. And as archaeologists and heritage managers, we sometimes know more about the success of these systems than uh, others. In the Sundarbans, it's, it's a bit more difficult, uh, I think, politically. Um, certainly in Bangladesh and West Bengal, the, 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 the county or the province of India where the Sundarbans are in, um, that is, you know, poverty is very widespread and the money required to, to do good coastal management isn't always there. Having said that, you know, the, the, um, that, 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 that interesting mixture of Hindu, Muslim religion with the tiger is still very strong and every shrine you see is still being attended. And so people do have that sense of place and do have themselves an understanding of, of, of that actually having that, uh, having that religion behind you helps to protect those absolutely crucial mangrove swamps and mangrove woodlands. Um, and Florida, so why are the four no's? Well, uh, if you know the political system in Florida, they, I'm afraid they have a climate change denying governor at the moment who simply doesn't believe in climate change. But also it is private property and the importance of private property in the American legal system that stops them working together uh, for a long term sustainable system that will work to everybody's benefit. And, uh, you know, if you, I mean, just Google, Google. Uh, flooding Florida and you will see tens and tens of stories how that happens on a daily basis. Okay, just very quickly, if you're interested in becoming an archaeologist who delivers to climate change debates now, I have four things to say. Please never say again that climate change is nothing new. So distinguish between the natural forcing of climate in the past and the anthropogenic forcing of climate in the, or the fossil fuel forcing of climate in the modern times and also when you observe lo in local or regional pollen cores or uh, other analysis changes in climate do not deduct from that de deduct from that that there is a global change to climate taking place because there are lots and lots of regional and local variations in a global model so put your local and regional climate curve into that global model and you have a much better argument the second recommendation is that you need, we need to adopt as archaeologists that language of climate change science. So we need to understand that people in the past were adapting and that's what we are looking at now. But sometimes they could do the, their own mitigation, that they 
have resilience, and that in anything you do, there will always be a feedback mechanism. So if you, as, as, of, as people, we have an impact on our climate and on our environment. Uh, we see that now with fossil fuel burning, but in the past, you know, we should be mindful that we shaped and created the landscapes we live in. Uh, and I think that is somewhere, somewhere the power of archaeology can come in, because in that sense, you know, people have tried lots of things before. A third uh, take-home message is we should recognize limitations of what the past and the study of the past can tell us for a modern world. And in particular, you know, population growth over the last century and millennia makes the, some of the solutions that we may find in the past uh, simply impossible to apply. So modesty in our aspirations is essential, but it doesn't mean we should be stum about our contribution. And what could a country be, be like? Well, we can provide long-term perspectives on the success and failures of how communities adapted to climate change, their adaptive pathways. And remember, I started talking to you about what happened 10 and 15 years ago, where people were still kind of denying the impact of climate change. We do not have long-term perspectives on the successes and failures of adapting to modern climate change, but we may have some how humanity adapted to, to natural climate change, which you know could be of relevance. And as I said earlier, you know, much of the climate change conversations are about the global scale, and the global scale doesn't mean much when you are here and now. Um, you know. And, and I think what we can do as archaeologists is show some of the le local and regional variations and what it means for people in the past. And we can tell these stories uh, that, you know, just because the world is warming, um, there will be periods of, of incredible of floods, of storms, of, of drought, of, of in the past that we have seen in the locality where people live, which could be quite powerful. And it is not just over there, and a long way away and in the future, but it, it happened in the past as well, and therefore there is no reason that it will happen here and now and where you live. And we need everybody to become much more conscious about the impact of climate change, because ultimately we all need to uh, change our, the way we live to start challenging and, and addressing climate change itself. And finally, I think there is, the, you know, often what we find is that, you know, that the, the sense of place the history itself, what gives the community uh, a sense of place and the value of that environment they live in, uh, it will change through climate change. You know, your vegetation will change. Um, you know, the, the heights of the embankments, so if you live near a river or a, or a sea, will change. Uh, lots of things will change. And I think we have a role to play to understand what is really important to people and that we can play a, a better role in finding ways forward in how we adapt or how we modify to the impacts of climate change and sea level rise, particularly in this case.